an ancient commentator on Aristotle, tells a story about a farmer who got a hold of Plato's Gorgias and read it, and was so stunned by it that he gave up the life of farming, he trudged his way to Athens, he looked at Plato and he put his soul in Plato's care. And the Gorgias is a wonderful book for encouraging that. It's a great speech encouraging one to follow the life of philosophy. And really what we've been doing throughout the entire class is looking at platonic protreptics. The word protreptic just means a kind of exhortation to do something. And we looked, first of all, at the very short protreptic in the Euthydemus, and then we looked at the Alcibiades I, which is a much longer protreptic, and now we're looking at one that's going to take us five weeks to wade through, but it all has the same story. In the end, philosophy wins. I'm sorry if I, I'm giving it away, but you all knew that would happen anyway, because Plato's writing it. The Gorgias is a very strange text for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, it's impossible to assign a dramatic date to it. There's a place in the text where the death of Pericles is mentioned as a recent event, which would place it at 429 B.C. The text itself, though, is set, obviously, during the time that Gorgias was in Athens. And Gorgias came to Athens in 427 B.C. So there's a two-year discrepancy there. There's a certain place where Archelaus is mentioned as having recently become the king of Macedonia, and that happened in 413 B.C. Callicles quotes a play by Euripides, Antiope, which was either premiered in 411 or 408 B.C. And Socrates mentions an event as having happened last year, and that event happened in 406 B.C. So that gives us the date 405. So this dialogue has at least five different dates, and yet it all takes place within the frame of a single span of time. Plato, of course, couldn't have done this through accident or, or a lack of historical sense. It's got to mean something. I have no idea what it means. But it's got to mean something. But at least we have to say that this dialogue takes place outside of ordinary time, its very setting is, in a sense, an attempt to annul, I suppose, one of the main features of the sophists and, and their teaching, which is the primacy of, of the ever-changing, ever-passing moment. Gorgias was the first theorist uh, of rhetoric who emphasized timeliness, the, the kairos, the moment. And... Disraeli once claimed, and he was quite correct, a student of politics and rhetoric that he was, that timeliness can overcome even great volumes of learning, even very rigorous arguments, things like that. If you give the right argument in an untimely manner, it'll fall dead-born from your lips, whereas a specious argument or a mere arbitrary exhortation, if delivered at the right time, hits home and, and changes people's minds. And one of the things that's essential about the teachings of the sophists is they tend to be followers in some way of Heraclitus, who taught that everything is in change, everything is in motion, everything is in flux, everything is in time. Whereas this dialogue is quite clearly outside of time in some strange way, where time has been speeded up in the background, whereas in the foreground it seems to be moving very slowly. So it's... I think a gesture in the direction of a metaphysics that's deeply anti-sophistical, that he has this strange, timeless quality about it. And this strange, unhinged time. Socrates is, of course, the main dramatis persona. And we all know him. He's a local, good-for-nothing philosopher. <laughs> Chirophon is the first pe person who speaks in the dialogue. He is a person who is mentioned both in Socrates' Apology to the Jury by Plato, and he's also portrayed in the clouds of Aristophanes. He was one of Socrates' old friends. He was known as the Bat. Uh, I don't know why. He's described as being a rather unhealthy-looking guy in the clouds. And he was the guy who went off to the oracle of the Ap god Apollo at Delphi and said, is there anybody wiser than Socrates? To which the oracle said, no. And Socrates says, this got the whole thing started. 
of course, that can't be a true story, because no one would have asked, if, is anyone wiser than Socrates, if Socrates didn't already have a reputation for wisdom. So the story can't really be a correct or true explanation of how Socrates came to philosophize. Now, the other three characters in the dialogue are Gorgias of Leontini. Leontini was a city in Sicily, a Greek city-state. Gorgias was a truly remarkable person. He lived either 105 or 109 years. Okay, so, Queen Mother uh, has something to shoot for. You can call him a sophist and a gentleman. Gorgias came to Athens, as I mentioned before, in 427 BC. He was an ambassador from his city, Lantini. He was a well-respected and trusted man, obviously of good breeding, and he wowed the Athenians with his amazing rhetorical speeches, which he wrote as showpieces. These were known as epideictic speeches, or just performance pieces. And oftentimes what he would do is he would take uh, a topic from mythology or from Homer, and he would write a speech for a character or persuade somebody about something. And the two most famous texts that have come down to us by Gorgias are, first of all, his Encomium of Helen, which is a defense of Helen of Troy from her accusers, and the other is the Apology or Defense of Palamedes, who is a character in Homer who was unjustly accused and put to death by Odysseus. And it's very interesting to read the uh, Apology of Palamedes because much of the rhetoric in there is in some strange ways echoed by the rhetoric of Socrates in, in his Apology. It really is interesting, though, the echoes of, of Gorgias in the, in the Apology of, of Socrates to the Jury by Plato, which is something I'd never noticed until this afternoon. The Encomium of Helen is a very famous piece, and these were published and widely read, as well as performed, in front of audiences. The first book of Gorgias was a collection of show speeches. Okay. The second book is called On Non-Being. And the book On Non-Being makes a number of extraordinary claims and argues for three theses, and I'll just read them to you as they have come down to us in the Testimonia. Gorgias says, Anything you might mention is nothing. Nothing exists. B. If it were something, it would be unknowable. C. If it were something unknowable, it could not be made evident to others. So, there is nothing, and if there were nothing, we couldn't know it, and if we could know it, we couldn't communicate it to anybody else. Okay, now, why is he doing this? What he's attacking is the notion that there is an objective truth. And if that fails, he is attacking the notion that you can know the objective truth. And if that fails, he falls back and attacks the notion you could ever communicate objective truth. Why is he doing this? Because he wants to deliver the, uh, us all into the world of opinion. Okay, and what are opinions? Well, opinions are beliefs that are neither necessarily true nor false. You can have true or false opinions, but you can't have true or false truths, or true or false knowledge, as Socrates argues. And so... Gorgias wants to argue that opinion is king. As Herodotus put it, custom is king, which boils down to the same thing. Opinion is king. Opinion is always shifting and changing. Opinion is indexed to time and place. You know, your opinions and mine change from day to day and from hour to hour and from place to place. It's just the way it works. And by arguing that we all live in a world of shifting opinions, Gorgias then argues that the art most fitted to rule over and govern a world of constantly shifting opinions is the art of persuasion. Because the art of persuasion, the art of rhetoric, is an art of seeming. It's an art of manipulating opinions and appearances in order to get one's way. So the rhetorician, the persuasive man, is king in the land of the blind, or the land of the, op of the opining, right? Now, Gorgias claimed, however, that in his actual activities as a teacher, all he taught was rhetoric. He did not teach his philosophy so much. That was something that he reserved for his own private edification. He did let his book be copied, and it was widely read, and fragments of it have survived. But he was primarily a teacher of rhetoric, 
And he's a particularly fine person for Plato's purposes here because unlike most of the other sophists, Gorgias did not claim to teach wisdom or prudence or, or, or virtue. All the other sophists claimed to some extent or another, with the possible exception of Prodicus, who's sort of a goofball, basically was a hair-splitting grammarian, lexicographer. But aside from uh, Prodicus, perhaps, all the other sophists, save Gorgias, claim <coughs> that they could teach you to be virtuous. Gorgias claims simply, I teach the technique, the craft, the art of rhetoric. That's all I teach. And he treats it as a completely morally neutral technique. Now, there are a number of things that Gorgias invented, as far as we know, in, in rhetoric. First of all, again, he invented, he already first thematized the whole issue of timeliness. Right? The right word at the right time means everything. He also was the first person to make thematic the necessity of always accommodating one's speeches to one's audience, which is the basic principle of rhetoric that Plato would certainly agree with. He also invented the Q&A session. Uh, after he gave his speeches, he would stand up and he would entertain any questions that people had and answer them in a, in a kind of dazzling, extemporaneous uh, fashion. Gorgias's literary style had a kind of jangling, uh, highly ornate, sing-songy quality to it. Uh, years and years later, Aristotle, in his rhetoric, describes it as in very poor taste. Uh, to which I say, I wish Aristotle's writing was in, is as in bad a taste as Gorgias's. Uh, if, if it were, it would be infinitely more readable. <laughs> Gorgias influenced Thucydides uh, in his literary style and his teachings. He influenced Agathon, the great tragedian, who is one of the characters in Plato's Symposium. He influenced Isocrates, that's with an I at the beginning, who was one of the great sophists and also lived about a hundred years. He influenced Antisthenes, one of the founders of cynicism. Pericles, although I find this a problematic claim, given that Pericles was dead before Gorgias came to um, Athens. Alcibiades, that's not a problematic claim at all. Alcibiades would be precisely the kind of guy who would have been searching out Gorgias in 427 BC. Critias, one of the 30 tyrants, an uncle of Plato, was clearly uh, influenced by Gorgias. And Mino, who is one of the main characters in the dialogue called the Mino, uh, is, a, is a great fan of Gorgias, too. So he was an extremely interesting guy. And I have a little handout here um, from the Encomium of Helen. And we'll just read you this together. He's talking about Helen, and he's defending her. And he says, whatever reason Helen had for going off to Troy, you can't blame her for it. She's a victim. And he says, what if she was beguiled by speech, by rhetoric? And at the bottom of the first column here, he discusses this, or it's in the middle of the first column where it says, eight, if speech, Logos, persuaded and deluded her mind, even against this it is not hard to defend her or free her from blame, as follows. Speech is a powerful master and achieves the most divine feats with the smallest and least evident body. It can stop fear, relieve pain, create joy, and increase pity. How this is so, I shall show. And I must demonstrate this to my audience to change their opinion. Poetry, poiesis, which means making in the broadest sense. As a whole, I deem a name speech with meter. To its listeners, poetry brings a fearful shuddering, a tearful pity, and a grieving desire. While through its words, the soul feels its own feelings for good and bad fortune in the affairs and lives of others. It produces sympathy in others suffering with. Okay. Now let me move from one argument to another. Sacred incantations with words inject pleasure and reject pain. For in associating with the, the opinion of the mind, the power of the incantation in chance persuades and alters it through bewitchment. The twin arts of witchcraft and magic have been discovered, and these are illusions of mind and delusions of judgment. How many men on how many subjects have been have persuaded and do persuade how many others by shaping a false speech. For if all men and all subjects had memory of the past, understanding of the present, and foresight into the future, 
speech would not be the same in the same way. But as it is, to remember the past, to examine the present, or to prophesy the future is not easy. And so most men on most subjects make opinion an advisor to their minds. An opinion is perilous and uncertain and brings those who use it to perilous and uncertain good fortune. This point here about is, is another argument for the sovereignty, if you will, of opinion in human life. If we knew everything, right, if we had good memories, if we understood what was happening in front of us, if we had the capacity to uh, have genuine insight into the future, we would have knowledge and not opinion. But because we have faulty memories, because we have deranged wits or slow wits, because we only understand things in hindsight, if we understand them at all, usually, and because the future is all just a matter of conjecture, we live in a world ruled by opinion. And that means a world ruled by opinion makers and opinion shapers. And that means a world ruled by sophists and rhetoricians and orators more generally. What reason is there, then, why Helen did not just go as unwillingly under the influence of speech as if she were seized by the violence of violators? For persuasion expelled her thought, persuasion which has the same power but not the same form as compulsion. A speech persuaded a soul that was persuaded and forced it to be persuaded by what was said and to consent to what was done. The persuader, then, is the wrongdoer because he compelled her while she who was, per was persuaded is wrongly blamed because she was compelled by the speech. To see that persuasion, when added to speech, indeed molds the mind as it wishes, one must first study the arguments of astronomers who replace opinion with opinion, displacing one but implanting another. They make incredible, invisible matters apparent to the eyes of opinion. This, in a way, is sort of an anticipation of Thomas Kuhn, right? For the longest time, of course, people believe that uh, there's nothing more certain than our knowledge of the heavens. They believe this during the age of the Ptolemaic system of astronomy, and now we believe it today. But Kuhn's attitude is, look, you know, these, these, well, um, these time-hallowed truths that people uh, cling to for a very long time uh, and are stubbornly resist exchanging are really just opinions. And that we were deeply wrong about Ptolemy, and we might be deeply wrong in a larger sense, about our vision of the cosmos today. Induction on the basis of past experience shows that science is a long history of plausible yet failed uh, theories. And if the past is a good guide to the future, then present-day uh, theories, which we regard to be as, uh, as well-founded and as true as anything, like the periodic table of elements and so forth, all of this might be changed. But if it is changed according to someone like Gorgias or someone like Kuhn, it's just the replacement of one opinion, well-founded, but still an opinion with another. Okay. Which is interesting. Okay, second, compulsory debates with words where a single speech to a large crowd pleases and persuades because written with skill, not spoken with truth. Now, written here is in a metaphorical sense. I mean, in the sense it means just enunciated with skill. You say it with skill, not with truth. Okay. Because it, it, people didn't sit around at these contests and read written speeches. They listened to them performed. Okay. Third, contests of philosophical arguments where it is shown that, that speed of thought also makes it easy to change a conviction based on opinion. Okay. The power of speech has the same effect on the disposition of the soul as the disposition of drugs on the nature and bodies. So this, this is his account of the nature of what he teaches. This is the best and only account that we have of, of the power of rhetoric. And you can see that it's a truly awesome thing in, in Gorgias' view. And it is a truly awesome thing. Just think of the amazing nonsense that people have been persuaded to believe throughout history. The most vicious and amazing nonsense. It is an awesome power. And it also can be used for good, too. And you can forgive Gorgias for thinking that it's the king of all the crafts or arts, that it has the right to rule over everything, because in many societies it does. Socrates doesn't deny that rhetoric rules. He just denies that it, it's the rightful ruler of all things, and that, what philosophy, and that philosophy really is the rightful ruler of all human affairs. I'm going to read a couple little fragments that have come down that I really am fond of from, from Gorgias. 
One must defeat the seriousness of one's opponents with laughter, and their laughter with seriousness. This is a brilliant one. This is on the nature of tragedy, and you, it, it, it's, it's exactly what pissed off Plato about tragedy so much. He has it beautifully encapsulated. Tragedy produces a deception in which the one who deceives is more just than the one who does not. The tragedian is a liar, but he is more just than the person who doesn't write tragedies and therefore doesn't deceive. He's a better man for lying to us. And he goes on, and the one who is deceived is wiser than the one who is not. So if you're sitting there watching Hamlet and you suspend disbelief and you're swept up into it, you truly are beguiled and deceived by the whole thing, you have the experience and you become wiser by being deceived. Where the one who just can't ever get into it is just sort of sitting there thinking, God, this is long, it's so implausible. This person, because they're not deceived, remains relatively in a state of folly. So I just think that's magnificent uh, as a statement of this strange, paradoxical nature of truth uh, and fiction when used in great art. This is an inscription at the basis of a statue of Gorgias that was erected at, Olymp uh, at Olympia. Gorgias himself was a rich man, and it wasn't uncommon for men to erect statues to themselves so he might have penned these words, so they're included amongst the fragments. No mortal has yet found a finer profession, or, and it's actually a profession, really, techne, finer art than Gorgias, to train the soul for the contests of virtue. I guess he finally gave in and decided to train people in virtue. His statue stands in the veil of Apollo, a tribute not to wealth, but to the piety of his character. And he was a decent and good man, and this is one of the things that's very clear about his treatment in the Gorgias. Socrates regards him as a fine and good man, as a gentleman. This is why it's so easy for Socrates to reduce Gorgias to stammering helplessness in less than 16 pages or so. Uh, yeah, it's, it's tough love. It's tough love. You have to reel up. <laughs> Winston Churchill once said about uh, Clement Attlee, when somebody said, Prime Minister Attlee is a very modest man. He says, he has every right, he has every right to be. He has much to be <laughs> modest about. <laughs> and Socrates, by the same token, is a very egotistical man, but he has every right to be. It's justified, I think. And I'll try and persuade you of that as well. So let's actually turn to the text now. If it begins on page, what, uh, 25... Okay. The first word of the dialogue is polemos, war. Plato had a lot of choice in writing. Greek is a language that gives you lots of options about word placement. So he could have put any other word there in that sentence, or any other sentence there he wanted to um, compose, but he wouldn't put the word war there. And I think that that's an extremely uh, important little clue about things, although finding one particular meaning for it is uh, somewhat baffling to me. First of all, the Peloponnesian War had gotten started, the war that led Athens through its uh, imperialism and arrogance to its downfall and destruction as a major power. Plato also believes, of course, and he's right, that when you have wars, uh, wars are always about issues of justice and injustice. They're about the greatest things. Uh, they're struggles over the greatest things. And what we have here is a war, a small war, in a sense a war for the souls of people that's being fought against the background of a much larger war. And uh, Socrates is constantly mentioning in examples building fortifications and, and the great statesman who brought Athens to its uh, peak. And he argues that these people were not friends but corruptors of the people and made them worse rather than better. There's a lot of truth to that. It's, it's kind of odd, though. Uh, Callicles is the one who begins it with the word war. In war and battle, they say, one must take part in this matter, Socrates. Oh, so have we then come, as the saying goes, after the feast and too late? It's a very obscure opening, and I, I, I frankly find it kind of baffling. And uh, Callicles says, yes, it was a very urbane feast indeed for Gorgias, just a little while ago, made a, a display for us of many fine things. He did one of his great stunt speeches, obviously. And then he was having a Q&A session, as he was wont to do. 
And um, this was in some kind of public place. And uh, it, it becomes clear, though, on the next page that Callicles is a citizen of Athens. His neighborhood is mentioned later in the text. And that he is the host of Gorgias. Polus is a foreigner. Uh, he's a student of Gorgias. He was a real historical character. He wrote a book on rhetoric. His, wor- his name means cult. And there is something kind of cultish and enthusiastic about Polus. He's, he's young and enthusiastic. Uh, uh, he's also less of a gentleman than Gorgias, and therefore more willing to speak shameful things. Okay. And he upbraids Gorgias for allowing his sense of shame to give Socrates a hold on him and uh, let Socrates defeat him in their struggle. Callicles is even more shameless than Polus. And so there's a kind of downward plunge that goes on here. It's interesting because it's very clear that in some ways, well, Polus is the one who's closest to Gorgias. He seems to be a student who travels with Gorgias from place to place. Whereas Callicles is obviously not someone who's traveled with him and therefore hasn't spent as much time with Gorgias. And you see that there's a kind of variation in their temperaments and their characters that seems to vary with the distance they are from Gorgias. The more gentle, the closer to Gorgias, the more gentlemanly, but the more ineffectual they are against, against Socrates. Whereas the further away, namely Callicles, the less gentlemanly, but the more intractable and the more difficult for Socrates to get a grip on and to defeat. This is why fully three-fifths of the dialogue is devoted to the conversation with Callicles. Callicles is a tough nut to crack. Uh, Socrates is, is very, fairly adept, though, at getting a handle on, on uh, Gorgias and finds it a little less uh, easy, but still manages to defeat Polus. And he defeats them by appealing in some ways to their sense of right and wrong, to their sense of idealism. Callicles doesn't think he has that. And Socrates has to work hard to try and get his hands on that. If there's some little, little bud or shoot of that still left in the soul of... Uh, Callicles, Socrates is going to find it and try and nurture that because that's that's how he's going to defeat him. It's interesting. The top of twenty six, Cal- uh, Socrates says, uh, for this, for the fact that I missed the main speech, right, the display, Chirophon here is to blame since he since he forced us to fritter our time away in the agora. Now this is a very strange statement, and I don't quite quite know what to make of it. Socrates, of course, is the one who's always being accused of frittering his life and time away in the agora, talking about what? Well, philosophy, of course. And uh, here he's uh, he's blaming his friend Chirophon for making him late to see a long speech by a sophist by frittering their time away, presumably making short little question and answers uh, about uh, about philosophy. It's hard to know what to make of this. It strikes me that Socrates could have gotten there in time if he wanted to, and that he's blaming his lateness on his friend, but it's probably not true. Uh, Socrates didn't want to hear the speech of Gorgias. He came for the Q&A. And that's his forte, questioning and getting answers. It, it's interesting, too, the, the role that Chirophon plays here. Socr- Socrates, uh, a little below on page 26, first asks, first asks Chirophon, to speak to Gorgias. He doesn't want to speak to the man directly. He has this intermediary, this friend Chirophon. And then what happens is there's a little mini-dialogue in page 27 between Polus and Chirophon, a little dialogue between the two students, one of Socrates and the other of Gorgias, about what Gorgias is. I don't know what the role of it is. It seems to be pretty lackluster, right? But... Clearly, Socrates has taught Chirophon Socratic questioning, and he already gets off with deal, uh, off on the right foot using all these craft analogies. Well, is he a doctor? Is he a painter? What would you call him if he were a doctor? You'd call him a doctor. If he did painting, you'd call him a painter. Well, what does Gorgias do? And at this point, Polus says, well, he does the finest art. And Socrates realizes, uh-oh, a speech is going to start here. There's going to be a long string of cliches, uh, a filibuster is, is about to spring forth, but he's not answering the question. So Socrates finally cuts off his student 
And he turns to Gorgias and he says, okay, Gorgias, I want to know who you are. And it's very interesting. On 26, where it says 47D, Socrates says, you know, ask him. Chiron says, what shall I ask? And Socrates says, who he is. Ask him who he is. Now, this is, you know, a kind of existential question. Who, who am I? You know, I'm always asking myself that. Why didn't we sleep last night? Probably kept worrying about that. Um, who am I? Or who, who is he? That's a, that's a question about the self. And it's, it's an exhortation to engage in a little self-knowledge and explain yourself, who you are. But it's interesting what the interpretation that Socrates immediately apply, uh, you know, provides for that question is. Socrates says, um, Chirophon says, well, how do you mean that? And Socrates says, just as if he happened to be a craftsman of shoes, he would answer you, I suppose, a cobbler. Or don't you understand what I'm saying? Now, it's not obvious that once you say, you know, ask him who he is, that the answer you want to get is what craft he practices. Right? Uh, and, and why isn't that obvious? Somebody walks up to you and says, who are you? Is the first thing you uh, you come up with is, well, I... You're more than just what you do. Yeah, you're more than your craft, right? There's more to you than what you do. Even the worst workaholics you know, still have to go home sometime and do some other things, right? I mean, there we're more to us than our craft. But I think what this does, is, in a kind of subtle way, it forces us to confront an issue that is going to be expanded upon and ramified in all directions in the rest of the text, and that is the inadequacy of art or technique or craft to the task of philosophy. And the task of philosophy is always connected in some way with the task of knowing yourself. And if craft is not an adequate answer to who one is, then that's the first clue that there is some kind of problem with craft or art or technique that Socrates is going to bring out more and more. Because let me just tell you right now, Gorgias thinks that he has a craft, it's a true art or technique, that has the right to gather together and rule over everything else. And so it's a technique that has an incredible supremacy and power. And it really is a contender with philosophy for this craft uh, of the queen of all the sciences and arts, the most important thing that uh, has the right to rule over, guide and criticize all human activities. Anyway, there, there, there are questions and oddities about this opening. Why doesn't Socrates immediately begin speaking with Gorgias? Why does he send a relative piker in there to do his job. He sends a boy to do a man's work, namely Chirophon, and Chirophon ends up talking with one of the students. And then he finally rests it away and takes control, and uh, he begins questioning Gorgias. It's interesting. Gorgias, although Socrates treats him with respect, and he does have a good heart in some ways, he's something of a boaster and a braggart. Now, again, uh, he has every right to be in some ways. He was an extraordinary fellow. But at the top of 27, Gorgias says to Chirophon, True Chirophon, I was just now making exactly those professions, and I say that no one has ever has yet asked me anything new for many years. You can ask away, but, you know, if you come up with a new one, I'll be quite surprised. Well, that's a really boastful kind of claim. I've heard it all before. He lived a long time, but he wasn't that old by this time. <laughs> by the time he was 109, he could really make this claim with, uh, without uh, being accused of uh, arrogance. On page uh, 29, Socrates asks uh, Gorgias to make brief speeches, namely just question and answer. And about two or six lines down, well, five lines down, he says, for indeed this too is one of the things I assert, that no one could say the same things in briefer speeches than I. If you want it short and sweet, well, I'll give it to you short and sweet. He says, no one's better at that than me. And a little further down, he says, I shall do so, and you will assert that you've heard no one briefer of speech. He's a boaster, a braggart. The conversation with Gorgias and Socrates begins really on page 28. And 
Socrates says, what art do you practice? Gorgias says, I practice the art of rhetoric. Now, rhetoric has two different senses to it. On one hand, when you talk about rhetoric um, or rhetor, you refer to what a, a person who teaches rhetoric would know, kind of theoretical knowledge of persuasion. That would be a rhetor, a rhetorician. But another sense of the, the practitioner of rhetoric is, is just the practitioner, not the theorist who teaches, but just the statesman, the orator, the person who's out there persuading. It's a, it's a very broad definition, a broad concept, put it that way. It includes both a theoretical and a practical dimension to it. Now, one of the things that comes out immediately here is that Gorgias thinks that because he has an art, he can teach his art. And this is one of the characteristics that we discussed before of art, or techne. Techne is always teachable. And this is one of the points on which it's distinguished from wisdom, because wisdom, according to Socrates, somehow isn't. And we talked about how perplexing and strange the claim that it's unteachable really is. What is rhetoric about, Socrates says? Well, he says, uh, Gorgias says, it's about speeches. And um, at this point, so Socrates says, well, you know, well, some arts make speeches about health and sickness, and we call that art the art of medicine. Some people make speeches about physical fitness, and we call that art gymnastic. If yours is an art of speeches, it's got to be different somehow from gymnastic and medicine and so forth. Now, at this point, Gorgias could make a distinction here that could allow him to maintain the claim that rhetoric is a science, if you will, of speeches. And that is to make a distinction between the form of a speech and the content of a speech, right? Socrates is focusing right in on the content of speeches. Doctors talk about health, gymnastic instructors, trainers talk about fitness and things like that. But if you say, well, wait a second, no, I'm not talking about the content of speeches, but their formal qualities, the qualities by which they persuade, he could have maintained that definition, that it's a science of speeches. And in fact, this is exactly the, what rhetoric means for Aristotle. Study of the common formal features that exist amongst all the different forms of persuasion. No matter what you're being persuaded about, there are certain common things that cut across all these different bodies of knowledge, and that's a formal kind of knowledge as opposed to knowledge of content. But Gorgias is caught up in this issue of content. And the, so the first thing he says, well, look, my art that I teach is a liberal art, in a way. He's, he, it's a gentleman's kind of art. Why? You don't need to get your hands dirty. You know, doctors have to touch phlegm and blood and induce vomiting and all kinds of gross and yucky things, right? Uh, midwives have to take care of afterbirths. and it, it's You get your hands dirty. And the same thing with athletic trainers. You have to deal with flabby, out-of-shape bodies and sweat. and it, it, you, get in, you get your hands dirty. But my art exists entirely in and through speeches. You don't have to get your hands dirty. It's, it's the kind of thing that a gentleman should practice. Right? Uh, and and Socrates says, well, you know, but there are other arts that don't get their hands dirty, too. For instance, mathematics, geometry, calculation, all of these things exist entirely in and through speeches. So what's the difference, again, Gorgias, between what you're doing and what they're doing? Socrates says, look, the way to differentiate what you're doing from what other pure speeches are doing is to talk about what it's a speech about. What is rhetoric about? What does it persuade about? And Gorgias gives a kind of non-answer, the greatest and best of human affairs. At least he gives us some content, human affairs. The greatest and the best, but what are they? Right. He gives a characteristic of them, but he doesn't say what they are in substance. What is the greatest of human affairs? What is the best of human affairs? And Socrates responds, look, if I go to a financial advisor, he's going to say, wealth is the greatest and best of things, and his art deals with it. If I go to a doctor, he'll say that health is the greatest and best of things, and he helps you restore it. If I go to a, a trainer, the guy says, getting in good shape is the greatest and best of things, and, and my art deals with it. So what you've said isn't, is, doesn't differentiate your art from what anybody else would say. So again, he says, come on, Gorgias, tell me what rhetoric really is. Tell me what the difference is between it and the other arts out there. 
And Gorgias says that what is greatest and best in human affairs is freedom for oneself and power over others. And if you want to put it in a, in a slightly unpleasant way, uh, the acme of freedom for yourself and power over others would be tyranny. But he doesn't preach tyranny. That would be disreputable. But he says the greatest of human things, the greatest thing in human affairs is freedom for yourself and power over others. And then he says, look, if you go into the political realm and you have the art of persuasion, that money maker is going to be making money for you. The doctor is going to be working for you too, and so will the physical trainer. They'll be your slaves. So the art of rhetoric gives you power over the practitioners of the other arts, and in that sense it's a kind of ruling art. And Socrates says, so am I to understand you correctly that what rhetoric does is it produces persuasion, produces something in the souls of listeners. It has an effect on the soul, and here the soul enters in and it becomes important. Everything is going to be evaluated ultimately in terms of what work it does on and for the soul. And Socrates says, it produces persuasion, it persuades and beguiles the soul. But he says, I still don't know what that is, and I still don't know what it's about. What is it being persuaded about? I know it gives you freedom and power, but what do you have to talk about to people to get freedom and power? And finally, Socrates says, he also goes on and says, look, all the other arts persuade too, for that matter. Geometers give persuasive definitions and uh, proofs, right? All the arts persuade. What are they persuading about? And what does rhetoric persuade about that differentiates it? And the answer is, ultimately, he says, well, it persuades people about issues of justice and injustice. And here we get to the really important things. Here's where Socrates' ears start pricking up. Uh, now he's getting somewhere. And then he immediately makes a distinction between two kinds of things. Well, it's a kind of fourfold distinction, if you will. He makes a distinction between having learned, or you can say knowing, versus learning or you can put it this way, coming to know. And why he makes this distinction here is less clear to me, because it seems like he could have just eliminated this, at least at this point. Because the main distinction is not between this and this, but between knowing in a general sense, which would include, include coming to know and knowing itself, knowing versus opining, or opinion, right? And the way he puts that is in terms of having belief, having beliefs, opinions, okay, and coming to have opinions, the actual activity of persuasion. And this is the most important distinction, <clears throat> opining versus knowing. Okay. What do we do with this? Socrates then says, look, is it not true that when it comes to knowing, there's only one kind of knowledge, and that's true knowledge. Right? If it's not true, you don't know it. It doesn't make, make any sense to say, I know it, and it isn't true. I know that we're all in this room right now, but that isn't true. Uh, if it's knowledge, it's true. However, it does make perfect sense to say, well, it is my opinion that Al Gore is going to have an uphill battle. That's my opinion. Now, that could be either true or false, right? I could be right, I could be wrong, because that's a matter of opinion. Opinion is always possibly infected by falsehood, whereas truth is pure of it. Now, he makes a distinction between two different kinds of persuasion, then. The first is the kind of persuasion that produces knowledge. The second is the kind of persuasion that produces opinion. And Gorgias makes it very clear that what he does is he teaches people to get up in front of the many, the populace, people sitting in councils and juries and things like that and persuades them. So, Socrates says, so what kind of persuasion do you use with the many? And he says, well, the kind of persuasion that produces opinion, of course. And the, and the underlying reason for that is that it's hard to know things, and it's hard to convince people that things are really true, or to give people knowledge. But it's very easy to give people opinion. Uh, the standards for having opinions are much less rigorous than the standards for having knowledge. And when you get into social life, you find that sometimes truths are very unpersuasive and sometimes falsehoods are more persuasive than the truth. Okay, that's, just, that's just the sad fact. And there was this uh, special I saw where um, 
this couple was going to uh, adopt a child in Peru. And they said that they realized very quickly that by telling the truth, namely, they wanted to adopt a kid because they wanted to have a kid, that everyone thought that was terribly implausible. And so what they had to do is they had to tell a lie that was more plausible than the truth in order to convince the authorities there that they would be good parents and that their motives were right. So they had to, I don't know, maybe they talked about how they were on a mission to save the children of the third world or something like that. You know, they, they cast it and they made themselves out to be regular Princess Dianas, right, rather than just ordinary selfish people who just want to have a kid, okay? And that was that was a falsehood, but it was more persuasive than the truth. And that's just the way the world works oftentimes. So if you're, you're in a trial by jury, don't be so naive as to think that the truth will set you free. Sometimes the truth is very implausible. And sometimes, you know, you owe it to yourself to think, is this implausible truth, do, uh, do I owe myself better than telling this implausible truth when a more plausible lie might get me off the hook, given that you're innocent, of course. If you're guilty, you should feel better. Yeah, yeah. if you're guilty, of course, you shouldn't want to do that. You should want to get your punishment. And Socrates talks about how we all have a right to be punished. It's for our own good. And that you're worse off if you do bad things and don't get punished. It's a very strange notion of punishment that bears very little resemblance to what we call criminal justice in America today. He's a great advocate of rehabilitation. I think we've pretty much given up on that illusion uh, that what our jails and prisons are doing is rehabilitating people. Although sometimes God might rehabilitate people who happen to be in jail, but it sure as hell isn't the system. Let me just re re give you a quick resume. Socrates says, look, the power of rhetoric seems preternatural to me. It can do so much. And Gorgias says, you don't know the whole of it, Socrates. It gathers together and holds under itself all power, so to speak. It makes all the other arts effective. Without rhetoric, none of the other arts can achieve their ends. And then he goes on at the bottom of this page, 38, to argue that just because rhetoric gives you the power to do certain things, that doesn't mean you should do certain things. You should use it rightly. And here it's very clear that uh, Gorgias is understanding rhetoric to be merely a techne, merely an art, because remember one of the characteristics of art is that it is morally neutral and can be used well or wide or badly. And whether or not it's used well or badly has to do with some external kind of knowledge that comes down and supervenes upon it, namely wisdom, or the lack thereof, quality.